Okay, so we're popping, we're popping in now. Um, so this is, again, our friend Lee from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, like on her wall, but she's not actually there. She's from home with her cat and her snake and a wide variety of specimens. So today is going to be a little bit more advanced, just warning you parents that you might see your students will always give them the option of looking or not looking just so that they know. And um, so Lee's gonna give you the heads up if they're real specimens or if they're not real specimens and what they are before you see them. Because we're talking about body works, all the stuff that's inside your body that makes your body the most amazing machine on earth. So um, we will, oh, you're eating? Oh, Gabriella. Well, Gabriella, we know you and we know that you're one, you know, you, you can handle this. She taught you before on Cisco. Yes, River, for sure. Absolutely she has. So I'm going to turn it over to her because I know we're going to have a full 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer and enjoy um, Body Works. Yay. Thank you, Mally. And I got to remind my friend Katie to do whatever magical thing she does to get there we go. Sweet. And do I have the share thingy? Oh, I do. Look how exciting. Cool. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, students from all over the place, hey, welcome to my apartment. I'm going to turn that there so you can see the whole thing back there. I'm uh, talking to you from Cleveland, Ohio, but I'm not actually at the Cleveland Museum of Hat Natural History. I am sitting in my apartment and I'm delighted to be hanging out with you today. This is one of my favorite classes because when I was a kid, I was super into blood and guts and stuff. I mean, I would go out and find some poor little animal that didn't know about animal, about cars, and I'd like look at its little body on the road. I mean, I'm really into it. So I don't want to gross anybody out during this program. And I will always warn you before I turn on my little special camera and show you any of the human specimens that I have today, because I do have real human ones. And I'm going to be sharing my screen with you right now so you can see the beginning of the program. And by the way, my friends, Mally and Katie, are eyeballing the chat over there because sometimes I'm really bad at remembering to look over and see if there's questions on the chat. So I give them a total interruption power. They can jump in there and say, wait, wait, you missed a question because there's a strong potential that I will indeed miss a question here or there. So right now, I have shared my screen and what you should all see is blue and it says Body Works up there from the Natural History Museum. And a funny little outline of a dinosaur. This program really doesn't have much to do with dinosaurs, but that is our official logo at the museum. Now in this program, what we're going to talk about, oh, Cam says, hello, uh oh, did we lose you, Cam? We are gonna <laughs> we're gonna talk about a lot of different things. Cells and skeleton and muscles and nerves and breathing, respiration, circulation, and also why exercise is good for all of those various parts. And we're going to try to get it all in in 45 minutes. But if we run a little wee tiny bit over, and if you have questions afterward you want me to answer, you could always send them to my friends, Mally and Katie. I bet you they would help get them to me. Right now, I have a giant number on the screen. It says 75. Oh my gosh. I wonder if anybody knows what the heck is that number with 12 zeros after it? It's not a thousand, it's not a million. It's not a billion. Oh, you're close though, Cam. You're close. Not a billion. What's the one that starts with TR? Anybody know that one? Yeah, a trillion. And you know what? Somebody just made up that answer, my friends, because seriously, nobody actually knows how many cells that a body is made out of because cells are so tiny. You can't, I mean, you have to use a microscope to count them. But what we, what we do is we estimate. We say, for example, if this guy, Ah, here's my virtual patient. How's it going, folks? This guy, his name is Seymour, because you can see more of him than just about everybody else. And all of these are representing many of the organs <laughs> we're going to discuss today. So if this guy went to the doctor and he said, man, I'm feeling kind of sick. And the doctor said, all right, well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to listen to you with the stethoscope and maybe I'll take a little blood out of you and stuff. And if I can't figure out what's wrong with you, I might go in there and get a little tiny piece 
of your organ that you think is a problem. Like maybe if your lungs, you're coughing a lot, I'll take a little piece of organ now and I'll go put it under a microscope and look at that. And then I can see those cells and you can count how many are right there on that little piece that you got out of his body. And then you just estimate. So yeah, if you ever go onto some other website or look up and say, what did you say, Cam? Million, bajillion, trillion. I like that number a lot. Um, if you look up on some other website, how many cells a person is made of and you see a different number, that's okay because nobody really knows. But all doctors kind of agree mostly that it is trillion. So you're gonna see some number in front of 12 zeros. I've seen 30, I've seen like 80, yeah, but it's, it's big. Whoa, the next picture that I'm gonna put up there is what a human looks like when you're only made of one cell and then two cells. And then where it says four days, that would be like 16 cells. And then at that seven day mark, oh, that'd be a couple, maybe a couple hundred cells. And I want you to think about how little that is. Now, Mally, can you jump in there? Well, while I'm sharing my screen through WebEx, can the crew still see me like in a smaller box up high somewhere? Yeah, we can see you, Lee. We can see you in a small box, like a little teeny box. But if you want us to see you bigger, you're going to have to unshare. That. You can see me teeny. I'm going to put my fingers like right up close to the camera so you can see what I'm doing with my fingers. I'm putting my thumbs and my pointer fingers together and making the tiniest little hole that you can still see through. So you're making an easy weasy hole between your pointer fingers and your thumbs. And once you've established, okay, this is the teeniest, tiniest hole that I can actually see through. That's about how big you are when your body is made of oh, about like two or 300 cells. You're tiny. Look like, a human yet because you're just a blob of cells. The cells haven't, they haven't started taking on jobs yet. They're just all little human cells. So I think that's kind of cool to say, hey man, once upon a time, I was this big. <laughs> and I was inside my mom's body because I think most kids of the ages who are watching are aware that humans, you know, were born from moms. We're not like hatched from a chicken egg or something. So if you're all feeling really brave, I have some interesting models across the room. And what they show is what a human looks like when you're not this big anymore, when your little cells have started taking on different jobs. No storks, yeah, good point, Charlotte. It's a fun story though, about being brought from the stork. So I'm gonna show you this model, because I think it's pretty rad. It was made by a doctor whose specialty was teaching ladies about getting ready to have a baby. And I think that's a pretty neat thing to think about is, okay, what do I need to do to get ready to have a baby? And he made, this model. Now what this part is, is the part inside of a lady's body called the uterus where the baby grows. And then life size, this is life size, right there. That's how teeny tiny you are when you've only been growing inside your mom for four weeks. See, it says four weeks down there at the very bottom. And this little guy, oops, okay. This little guy is what you look like under a microscope. So really that up here, that's life size, what we look like. I'm gonna hold that, look at that. Once upon a time, there, I'll hold it still so it really gets focused. We all looked like a tiny little shrimp. How fun is that? And when you are a tiny little shrimp like that, you don't even have solid bones. All of your, kind of like a deformed reptile. Yeah, doesn't it though? And this little part down here, let me get back over there. This little part over here, whoop, that looks kind of like a tail. That's not really a tail, it's just the end of your spine. But because we haven't grown our big muscles on our rear end yet, yeah, it kind of looks like a tail. There you go, it's pretty cool. So for a while, our body is just a tiny little smushy thing with some cartilage, you know, stuff cut, that, that's your ear right here, all right, instead of your bones, which is pretty cool right there. I gotta put these down somewhere so I don't trip over them, so my cat will not play with them. All right, so that's phase one, appreciating that once upon a time, we looked pretty weird because we were not made of very many cells. Next phase is as we grow bigger and bigger and bigger and we get born, all those cells get organized and they start taking on different jobs. And the picture that I have up right now is showing a bunch of different kinds of cells and what they would look like under a microscope. Nerve cells are weird and kind of 
they look like they have tentacles all over them. Blood cells are pretty smooth because they have to slide through our veins and arteries. Muscles are stretchy. Well, okay, so if you like looking through microscopes and looking at cells, that's a job. It's called cytology, the science of studying cells. We got to put all these cells together and make a human. So there's a bunch of cells stuck together and you call that a tissue, like the same word that you would use, like a Kleenex tissue, I know, but it means a little piece of a cell. And then if you have a whole bunch of cells all doing the same job, then you call that an organ. In this case, it's a stomach, digestive stuff. And then you've got that whole human there who is the organism. Hey, pop quiz, my friends. But you can just type into the chat, yes or no, whatever your opinion is on this. Can you use that word organism to describe a plant instead of uh, an animal? Does organism still count? What do you think? So I lost the chat. Ah, I see a lot of yeses. Yeah, exactly. Because a plant is a living organism. And if you looked at different parts of a plant under a microscope, well, yeah, they're going to look different, like the roots and the leaves. They're going to look different because the roots job is to suck up water and nutrients from the ground. And the leaf, that's its job is to do photosynthesis. There you go. So if you're a doctor, sometimes the words that you use to describe our bodies are the same words that you would use if you were a, a veterinarian or if you were a botanist. That means somebody who researches plants too. I think that's kind of fun that we can use a lot of the words that we use to describe our own bodies for other creatures as well. All right, my friends, here we go. We're going to launch into our first specimen talking about both. I don't suppose anybody knows that trivia question that's up there right now. How many bones are there? And your body, your more grown up body, not a brand new little baby's body. Oh, 234, oh, you're so close, Lauren. I saw that question pop in there. <laughs> the, uh, the answer that most doctors are gonna give you is 206. Oh, look at that, Aiden and Owen, nice job. Babies, when they're brand new babies, they have more because their little bones aren't done fusing or growing together all the way. And our first specimen is, is going to illustrate that. Oh, nice, Lauren. Yep, babies have a little bit over 300. Your bones are alive, and I can show that to you with some of my specimens as well. They have squishy, bloody material inside of them called marrow. And the specimen that I'm going to show you is not a live bone, obviously. It is a very old bone that has been owned by the museum for many, many years. And uh, once you get, before I show it to you, what you're going to do is you're going to tell me the mineral that your bones are made of. We get it from eating the bones of animals. If you like to eat bones of fish, I do. That's like small bones when you, when you cook them so they're nice and soft. Or you get this mineral from yogurt and cheese and milk and stuff. Yeah, calcium, exactly. If you like milk stuff, I'm not a big fan of milk, kind of messes with my tummy, but look at this. This medicine right here comes, which usually a person would use to, if you had like an upset stomach, look, it says the word calcium right on there. Mm. And when I look at the ingredients in the very, oh, I know, marrow is good stuff, animal marrow. <laughs> it is good stuff. And the reason why it's delicious is because it's greasy, it's fatty, man. It's like, Kind of like butter almost because it's so swishy. Yeah. So on the ingredients back here, it's talking about calcium, which is that mineral that our bones are made of. So here we go. This is the experiment. I'm crossing my fingers. You can all see my specimen cam. You ready? Here we go. Specimen cam. Dun, dun, dun. And what hopefully you are seeing is a bone sitting on my kitchen table. And I am going to go over there right now and get it better lined up because it's kind of Whoop, there we go. That bone right there. What do you think there, gang? You seeing that bone? Let's see if it gets up. Oh, good. It is a human bone. And this bone that you are seeing, it's kind of, it looks pretty big, doesn't it? But I'm going to put my whole arm, well, my front of my arm there. So there's my whole forearm next to it there. So you can see it's about the same length as just my forearm. This is an adult human tibia. And your tibia is the bone that is in the bottom of your leg that sometimes we call your shin. So if you'd like to feel why it is that it hurts so bad when, when you get smacked in the shin, then I want you to feel the front 
of your leg. And when I say the front of your leg, I'm gonna put my whole leg, here's a maneuver for you. Here's my whole leg, check out my tattoos. <laughs> this piece of your leg right here in the front, not the bottom, because there's my, there's my dirty foot right there. I know I'm putting my foot on the kitchen table. What am I gonna do, right? <laughs> but that front part of your leg right here, that you can feel that sharp edge of that bone. Yep, that's this edge right there, man. Look how narrow that is. So when something goes smack against that, oh, you've just got this really thin edge of bone right up against your skin. So no wonder it hurts. All of the human specimens that I'm going to show you came from people who gave permission before they died that their bodies could be used as museum specimens. So this person was OK with us all looking at their body. I've now zoomed my camera in a little bit, and I'm hoping that's looking good on your screen. I want you to be able to see all those itty bitty holes that are in there. Because this part right here, it got a little bit broken. And inside there is where all the bone cells would be living. So if each one of those little tiny holes would have maybe 10 or 15 or 20 little tiny bone cells living in there. And there, I zoom back out again so you can see how little those holes are. That's a way to visualize that our bones are live parts of our body. The hard part, I'm gonna switch back to my regular camera now. The hard part that we think of as the bone itself, this is calcium, just a mineral from the ground. All those little tiny cells, man. That's their job is to pull in calcium and build that structure. So there, we've learned a little bit about bones right now and checked out our own body. Does anybody have a question about bones that you'd want to type in there that I can answer before we move on to our next system? <laughs> we have to glance over the, at the shin pads. Yeah, exactly. What about your cat? Oh, <laughs> my cats are both being super lazy and sleeping over there right now. Well, that's a great question, Charlotte. How does a bone heal? I'll answer that one. Then we're going to move on to our next, uh, our next body parts. Bones, because this part, this, what you're looking at here is just a mineral. It can't heal by itself because that would be like saying a rock. You know, a rock isn't alive. A rock doesn't heal, right? But it's all these little guys in there, those little tiny, tiny cells. What they can do is there's blood vessels that go in and out of our bones. And that means that the blood is carrying calcium from our food. So if there's a break in the bone, that means that all those little cells where the break is, they start pulling in more calcium and filling in that gap. Kind of the same way, you know, when you get a cut and a scab forms over the cut and then more skin grows underneath. That's basically what's going on with a bone, except they're not only growing more cells, they're pulling in more calcium, more of that mineral from your blood. Bones are pretty awesome. All right, well, what? Well, Nina, that is a hard question to answer. What color are cells? Because <sighs> technically they're so small. When you put cells under a microscope and just look at them with light shining through them, you can't see them. They're, they're so tiny. It's kind of like they're transparent. And that's why doctors use different coloring. It's kind of like food coloring that they drip on the cells that makes them colored. And that way you can see them better with a microscope. That's a, I'd have to ask a doctor if they even have not I've never heard a doctor tell me a name of the color of cells. So I think that they kind of consider them all sort of transparent. <laughs> but when you have a whole lot of them together, then, then you can see them. Like here, we have millions and millions of cells. So you can see them. I love it when you guys ask me tricky questions because then I can go bother doctors who help me write our programs. Hey, if you'd like to try stretching a little bit right now, there's three different kinds of joints in our body, and I've got their names up there. Ball and socket joints, gliding joints, and hinge joints. And that just means the way that the two bones are able to bend, the way they're attached together with stretchy ligaments and tendons that connect either bones to bones or muscles to bones or other parts of your body. So we're gonna try those three right now. If you just wanna feel the difference, it's kind of fun. Your shoulder is a ball and socket joint. This bone right here called the humerus has a round end just like a ball and it fits into the bones at your shoulder like that. And that means it can turn and twist every which way, right? So you can make your shoulder go in a circle, no problem, right? And you've got this joint right here, my elbow. And my hand looks huge when I do that. My elbow only goes 
this way. I want to put my hand over there. That's all the farther I have now to turn my shoulder. So if you want to try this out, you can put one hand on your shoulder, and stick the other hand out. Let me back up my chair a little bit. Can't you guys can support me? There we go. Hold your other arm out in front of you and have your shoulder hand on your shoulder. And when I move my hand across my chest, that's my elbow doing that work. I don't feel my shoulder doing much. But if I lift my hand up, oh, now, oh yeah, I can, I can feel something moving in my shoulder now. Mm -hmm. That gives you an idea that, ooh, this one is a joint that just moves one way. And this guy can move all the time. That's a whole job too. If you think that's interesting, like figuring out how the bones in your body fit together and how they move, studying bones and muscles, that's part of physical therapy and helping somebody heal if they've injured their body in some way. All right, my friends, I think we've goofed around with bones enough. Let's talk about some muscles here for a minute. Whoa, that's a graphic showing if you peeled all the skin off of a human and you could just see our muscles underneath the skin. And then up at the uh, left-hand side is showing a person's knee, which is the bones, but then all those muscles attached. So what I'm gonna have you all do is a little experiment with my eyeballs and it's going to be my eyeballs and my different muscles in my eyeballs. And those two words are up there, voluntary versus involuntary. What that means is, how does that muscle know it's supposed to move? Are you consciously thinking about it in your brain like, hey, I'm gonna put my hand over here. You consciously did that. But the involuntary muscles inside of our body, like our heart and the diaphragm, the muscle that we use to breathe, your stomach, your intestines, those are all muscles too. And they keep working. They keep doing their job when you're sleeping. That's why we call it involuntary because you're not really thinking about it. They're just doing their job. And there's different parts of your brain that handle all of it. So here's the experiment I'm gonna show you. You can do this with your own eyeballs later, but I'm gonna show you how to do it. Using both kinds of, ooh, I think it's possible that my little picture is over the top of that word. Let me move that over. I don't know if that affected what you guys are seeing or not, but now I can see voluntary and involuntary <laughs> on my eyeball picture. So what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna lean uncomfortably in toward the main camera of my computer. What you are all going to do is you're going to observe my pupil. That's the black hole. And yeah, that was a picture of an eye out of its socket, right? So the, the muscles of my eyeballs right here that I'm using right now, I'm going to look left. I'm going to look right. I'm going to look up. I'm going to look down. We've got six different muscles all around our eyeballs that, that pull our eyeballs in different directions. And those are voluntary because I'm doing that. I'm conscious, I'm thinking about it. I wanna look over there. But your iris, that colored part of your eye that's not the pupil, those are a bunch of muscles too. And usually they react to light. And I'm gonna show you that it's kind of fun to watch them do that. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get up uncomfortably close. Here we go. Right there. So now you can see my pupils, right? And I'm gonna close my eyes. I'm gonna close them for five whole seconds. Five, three, two, one. When I open my eyes, watch my pupils. Could you see them change size? <laughs> I'm gonna do it again, close my eyes. Five, four, three, two, one. Opening them now. <laughs> is it working? Hold on, I have to put my glasses back on because <laughs> when I do that, I can't see anything. Oh, sweet. Okay. So if you want to try that out, go in the bath, but go somewhere where there's a mirror, right? Not now, not now. Wait till we're done. <laughs> and get really close to the mirror and then have all the lights on in the bathroom so it's really bright, right? Close your eyes and just stay facing the mirror. Wow. When you pop your eyes open, whoa, you're going to see your pupil go whoop, and get smaller. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Yay. So if you want to try that out, um, you could also do it with a dog or a cat. If you have a pet like that in your house that you can get them to look right at you and you can change the lights in the room and see if their pupils change size too. It's kind of fun. There you go, my friends, crazy muscle stuff. I love it. Muscles are weird and cool at the same time. So now we tried an eyeball experiment. Let me think about this next, there we go. This next screen is showing that the muscles on your body, in order to move you around, you have to have partners because muscles only 
pull. They contract or they relax. The word contract is sometimes what you hear a doctor talking about if they're talking about your heart, is it contracts to push blood out of it. Or when a lady is gonna have a baby, sometimes they talk about, oh, she's having contractions because that muscle that holds the baby in is, is called, that's called contractions when you're having those, with those muscles squeezing to push the baby out. Whoa, so much baby stuff in this class. So what I, want, what I wanted you to feel is the idea of a muscle contracting. Just my camera here. All right, so in the muscle that's the easiest to do is your bicep. And there's my elbow right there, the inside of my elbow, the outside of my elbow. And when I pull my arm in this way, like hey, showing off my muscles, right? What happens here is that muscle right there, the bicep goes and it pulls in, it gets tighter. I can feel that it feels kind of tight right now. And the muscles back here, they're not doing anything. So the back of my arm is kind of, I can feel this is sort of flabby. But if I put my arm out the other way, like this, and I'm, I'm straightening my arm out really tight, like I'm a police officer saying, stop. Now, this muscle's all gushy and flabby. It's not doing anything, all relaxed. But the muscles back here, those feel tight now. So the muscles back here, their job is to go and straighten my arm out. This muscle's job is to go and pull my arm in. So it's just kind of neat to think about, whoa, man, all these different muscles on my body, all they do is they either contract or relax. That's all they do. There's no such thing as push to a muscle. Isn't that weird? When I first heard that, I was like, what? What do you mean? I can, I, like I'm pushing on the camera right now. Yeah, but, but what your muscle did was it pull, it contracted to pull your arm in, or these guys contracted to pull your arm out. The word push just means, which way am I moving that thing? So weird. <laughs> All right, enough fool around with muscles. We need to move on and see some more specimens because I got more stuff for you guys. All right, let me get to the next slide. And what are we talking about next? Brains. Awesome, your nervous system. It involves your brain. It involves your spinal cord sending messages down from your brain to the rest of your body. And it also involves those weirdo shaped little nerves called neurons. Now what I'm gonna show you on the brain. First, I want you to look at that crazy little, that little squiggly dude over to the left where it says neuron. And what that graphic is showing is the basic structure of a nerve cell. The circle in the middle, and I'm not sure if y'all can see my arrow hovering over that, but I'm circling my little arrow around there. That thing that looks like an eyeball in the middle, that is the, the center of the cell called the nucleus, where its DNA is. And then all the other squiggly stuff, that's the rest of the cell, that is called dendrites and axons. So what you're going to see on this real brain specimen I have is that the center part, that dot, makes the brain tissue a different color than the rest of the squiggly parts. You're not going to be able to see the individual neurons, but you will see the color difference in the specimen. So let's get this guy. No, let's move it on top and change. Nope, I was trying to be fancy, guys. Fancy didn't work. I want to go to the camera. There we go. So now you're seeing just blank table. But hold on to your hats, my friends. I have a slice of real human brain that I brought home from the museum. Let me get this all straightened out. Ooh, there we go. Whoa, that looks so crazy sitting on my table right now. So, <laughs> so what this is, is this is not an entire, I know it is a little gross, but I told you it was coming and I hope, I hope, uh, who's eating? Gabrielle, I hope you're done eating. <laughs> so this is a slice. Oh, there's a Gabrielle say too. Sorry. And you can see how it's really, so oh, good. I'm glad you're done. Look how skinny it is. That's not a whole brain on my table. That is just a skinny little slice of human. That's a good question, Katie. <laughs> it's how do I sleep with all these parts of my house? Well, because I know that this person, whatever their name was, I don't have their name because when they donated their body as a specimen, it was given to a hospital. So that hospital has all this person's records. And then when they gave it to the museum, they kept the records over there because I don't need to know who this person is. But I know that they were okay with us using their body to teach a class like this. Zoom in a little more. 
And if you can see, there's a bunch of little tiny labels on there. Like this one says mammillary bottle or body, and this one says pineal body right there. Yeah, it is real. And that one, I can't even pronounce that one. If you were a, do if you were a doctor who was studying what's called neurology, that means how your brain works, then you would have to memorize whoa, all those tiny little names of all those different brain parts, because that would be your job is to know what they do. I, however, do not specialize in studying the brain, so I have never memorized all of those names. This big piece right here, that's called the cerebrum. And if you like movies, like, um, I'm gonna lay this down and see if it looks cool or flat. Let's try this. I'm not sure which way it's gonna look better with the lights that I have in my house. Let's try this. Ooh, I like that. I'm gonna leave it flat for now. So this big piece right here, that's the cerebrum. And in X-Men movies, they called that computer Cerebro that Professor Xavier used to try and like find all the mutants. And it's kind of funny. That's the Cerebrum. And then this little dude back here, that's the Cerebellum. This part helps control muscles, basically, when you're learning how to do stuff, how your muscles move. And then this is all of your five senses and your memories and your ability to talk and all the other stuff that makes us human. And then you have the spinal cord coming down that way. So if I was gonna have this lined up the way it actually is in a person's head, I would go like this. There we go. That's the top of the brain, bottom of the brain, spine, head down your back. Well, we gotta look for those cells. Remember I said something about the cells. So I'm gonna flip this whole thing over now. And you'll be looking at the internal tissue of the brain. And it's two different colors. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to point at the two different colors that I'm seeing on my screen because that's the internal tissue, not the external tissue. I can tell that this edge out here looks more gray. And then this color in here looks more tan or kind of yellow. Now, one thing I should let you all know is that the brains inside your head are not that exact color. This brain has been in the museum in that liquid you can see sloshing around. That's preservative liquid called formaldehyde. And it's been in there for a really long time. I don't even know how long, well, way longer than I've worked there. So like 50, 60 years. And the color has kind of faded because the preservative sort of leaks out the color. Our brains are more sort of a purplish pinkish color. So don't let the color fake you out. But you can tell how this part out here is lighter than that part. And out here is where each one of those little brain cells, that's where their nucleus is. Whoa, and then this tan colored stuff is where all those little tentacles go. I think that's kind of cool. Now the brain is one of the only parts of your body that you can actually tell where the cell parts are by the color of the tissue. Oh man, this is a tease because now you guys can see my heart specimen over here. Oh, we're almost there. Get Mr. Brain out of the way so I don't knock him over. That would not be very respectful to knock over somebody's brain. Uncool. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just got back over here and I see all the chats going, <laughs> Your sister thought it was toast. Okay. Well, I guess <laughs> it is kind of brownish colored. So I, I could see that. That's a very entertaining comment right there. All right, my friends. Let's move on to another body system. We were just talking about brains and here's a couple of graphics just to illustrate that when we study brains, we make a little brain map like this. And those different colors represent that different parts of your brain handle different tasks. And if you have damage to your brain, if you've ever heard the term like having a stroke, it means blood is not getting to one part of your brain, then that particular ability might be affected. So a person could have a stroke and lose their ability to speak properly, but they could still hear and they could still think and they could still move their bodies. <laughs> and these are pictures of what's called a positron emission tomography scan. That's how we know what parts of our brains do, is that those scans are uh, used, and we have that pic in resource. Oh, you mean the positron emission tomography? Sure, I can, is that something I can do through uh, Katie and Mallory? To let me know. Can you repeat that, Lee? Sorry, I missed the question. Can we have a picture in. 
something. What they say? Resource. Yeah, I can oh. send. Sure. Let me just do a screenshot of it then. Okay. Just hold on, guys. Pause for a screenshot. And the reason why the brains are those different colors on this graphic is because the different cells are more active if they're showing up red. And they're, oh, I'm, I'm blocking some of the picture. I wonder if I can make that smaller. What if I do that? Whoop, there. <laughs> I moved it on my screen. And the, the cells that look blue or green are not working as hard. And the way, oh, the one before this one, you mean, let me back up. Hold on, Mountain. Back here, that one? Because the chat that came through said the picture before this one. So I'll leave this one up here for a second. That's the one you wanted? Sure, I don't mind. Screenshot. <laughs> you get it there, Mally? Yep. Hey, all right, cool. I love it. You guys are good. It'll uh, see, it'll take me a couple of days to get it done because we um, we have birthdays in our house, so I'm I need to focus on. Birthdays. Cool. Everybody, take a deep breath right now, because I got to show you heart and lung stuff now. Yeah, there we go. And the picture that's up there right now is some random little robo looking dude bringing oxygen into his body and then releasing carbon dioxide. We know that's why we have to breathe. We also know that plants do that backwards. They breathe in, they suck in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen as they are making their sugars. And it's amazing that the planet works out that way. It's pretty cool. And then you can breathe through your nose and your mouth, right? But not all animals can do that. If you are an animal that lives in the water, but you have to breathe air, uh oh, if you breathe in while you're underwater, you're going to drown. So some animals have completely quit breathing through their mouth. Whales are like that and dolphins are like that. They have no connection from their mouth to their lungs at all. They just swallow food with their mouth they just, and they breathe with just their nose, which we call a blowhole when you're talking about whales and dolphins. Oh my gosh, it's a funny question, Jordan. I, I know a lot of random sciencey things because I've worked at a lot of cool places. I used to work at a marine park called Sea World of Ohio, and I learned tons of whale and dolphin information there. And I've worked for the Science Center here in Cleveland and at the museum. So all of my crazy jobs have taught me so much stuff. I did study some science in school too. Oh, well, you're right. Fish use their gills to suck oxygen out of the water. Absolutely. But inside of our human lungs and all mammals, we have these little dinky holes called alveoli. And that word is kind of at the bottom right of your screen. Alveoli, when a person tries to draw them, eh, they look kind of like grapes, <laughs> but that's not exactly what they look like inside of your actual lung. So what I'm going to show you all next is I have a slice of actual, it does sound like olive oil. It's a funny observation. I'm going to show you a slice of human lung tissue and I'm going to compare it to a sponge because sponges basically are a great way to think about how in the world do your lungs work. So here is the little slice of human lung tissue. Just like I had a slice of brain. And it was a person who lived in a city, so they have a little bit of dirt and debris, a little bit of, of contamination in their lung tissue, but not a whole lot. But this camera is not, I'm going to use the other camera because it can zoom in a whole lot better. But while, while you're thinking about this word alveoli and why would they look like a bunch of grapes, that's because your trachea, your windpipe right here, it comes down into your chest and then it branches out. So you have two tubes coming down to two lungs. And then it gets smaller branches, smaller branches, smaller branches, until at the very tips of those little tiny teensy wincy branches that are called branches. Then each one kind of runs out of tube and it just kind of boop, it's a little hole. And that's where the air goes when you breathe, which would be kind of like the holes in a sponge, right? As I squeeze the sponge, I'm squeezing air out of it, and now it's really small. And that's like me going and breathing all my air, as much air out, so I have no air in my lungs at all right now. And then as I inhale, all the, all the air goes into those holes, right? That's how your lungs work. And then all this tissue, the spongy tissue, that would be a bunch of tiny, <coughs> I might myself cough at that demonstration. Time out. 
yeah. <laughs> while I rehydrate my vocal cords here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so all of this tissue here, that's where all the blood vessels are, picking up the oxygen and then taking it out to the rest of your body. But your lungs really are just like that, a bunch of holes. So if you're ready, let's go to the other camera and then investigate this lung a little closer. All right. Here's the lung sitting on my table. I'm gonna put this a little more over the top of it. Perfect. Now the flat part is right there. That is where your diaphragm or the muscle that moves your lungs would be sitting. And you can see some of these little black sort of look like stripes on it. Those are the little tubes, the bronchioles, the tubes that bring the air in. And then if I go super zoom, see, I think that's about as close as my iPad will go. Now you can see that it looks more like a sponge, a brown kind of dirty old sponge, <laughs> but there you go. So when you think about lungs from now on, my friends, I want you to really visualize sponge instead of balloon. And I think that's what happens with little kiddos that when they first, like a preschooler, you know, when they first learn about lungs, they just have two big balloons inside your chest. But no, nope, it's actually more like a great big sponge that is full of little tiny, tiny holes that hold that oxygen and then let the blood pick it up and carry it around your body. Tortilla, you guys are all hungry. <laughs> I do that. I totally do the same thing. I describe everything like food. I always do. <laughs> I think that's funny that you guys are too. All right. You've been teased with that heart sitting over there. I know I've been teasing you. Let's get to it, man. Now, when I was a little kid, I used to have, I would go hunting with my dad, my uncle. They were both bow hunters and we would get a deer. We have white tailed deer around here in Ohio. And we would get the deer and then they would cut it up, you know, and get all the guts out and stuff just out in the field. So when I was a little kid, I just learned what all the blood, I mean, this, to me, when I look at this, I'm like, yeah, whatever, that's nice, but it's just plastic, right? Because I was used to seeing whoa, all the blood coming out of the animal along with all these organs, right? So for me, I was like, no big deal. But I've learned through teaching these classes, I don't want to freak anybody out. But some kids are like, what are you showing me? So the heart that I have is really an actual human heart, just like that was a real human lung, but there's no blood in it because it's been cleaned out for this kind of teaching, right? So we don't want blood all over my kitchen table. That'll be nasty. So let's get into my PowerPoint one more time and appreciate some heart language. And then I'll put the specimen up. Oh, there's the word diaphragm. Sorry, I, for I totally forgot I had this in my PowerPoint. Sweet. There's the word diaphragm that I said. It's a weird word, man, spelled with a P-H-R in the middle of it. But that's the muscle that moves up and down to push air in and out of your lungs. All right, here's a heart graphic. Now, I don't know about you all, but I have never seen blue blood come out of a human being. Has anybody out there ever seen somebody bleed blue blood? Does it happen, right? Now, if you were now, if you were a horseshoe crab, if you were a lobster, if you were an octopus, you would have blue blood in your body. And that's because your blood would have a, a, a metal called copper in there. And copper turns kind of bluish greenish when it touches oxygen. But we're humans and we have iron in our blood, not copper. And iron turns really red, like rust on an old car when it touches oxygen. So inside of mammals, our blood is always red. Or and greenish, kind of a greenish, yeah, yeah, well, copper does that. Copper turns kind of greenish. Let me get this, hold on, I wanna show you guys my, my old lady, uh, my old lady veins. When I hang my hand down like this, you can see these, these things popping out that look kind of blue right there. And those are, yeah, and that is totally why blood tastes like metal. Who said that? Charlotte, that is an excellent observation. Nobody's ever said that before. Anyway, connected north kids, you guys are, and when you like, yeah, when you get a nosebleed or something like that, it, it does taste like metal. Absolutely. Personally, I think that's why my cat likes to chew on my silverware. I've never asked the cat about this, but my cat <laughs> likes to go over if I'm washing dishes or something. He'll sneak over and he'll grab like a fork and just be licking it and chewing on it. 
And I, I bet you that's why, because it sort of kind of tastes like blood and he's a, he's a carnivore. The cat sometimes. Okay, so back to these uh, veins here. These dudes right here on the back of my hand that look blue, those are veins. And the tube itself, it's blue. I mean, the tissue of that tube is blue, but the blood inside of it is just really dark red. And then as that dark red blood gets pushed back to my heart and to my lungs, well, it gets oxygenated, and then it's really super bright red. But it's never blue, because we're not in space. There you go. All right, so if you guys are ready, I'll take a look at my human heart. And plastic and soap, whoa, you guys have an interesting cat. <laughs> We're gonna go to the last time for my super cool little camera on my table. Boop, oh, there's still, that is still a lung. We do not need that lung anymore. Excuse me. And the human heart that I'm gonna put down there is inside of a protective box, but I'm gonna take it out of the box. Put it right there, ta -da, on the table. There you go, my friends. Human heart, what? And you are seeing it from the front right now. Now, if any of you are like me and you've ever seen an animal that was being cut open for food and you have seen the animal's heart, you might think to yourself, well, that looks kind of sort of like that animal's heart. And you're right, because pretty much all mammals, our hearts look the same, whether you're a horse or a dog or a cow or a human or a seal. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mally. Yep, because we're all mammals and mammals have the same basic heart structure. This is the big muscle right here in the front called the left ventricle that pushes blood out to your body. You can see little tiny blue blood vessels on the outside of the heart. And those are the coronary arteries. These are the little arteries and blood vessels that take blood to the heart muscle itself. This funny little squishy part right here that looks kind of like a, a squiggly ear. That's one of the top holes inside your heart that fills with blood when your heart beats. That is called an oracle. That word oracle, it's actually the word for ear in Latin, like ear, which is weird because it's not an ear, but I guess somebody thought it looked like an ear a long time ago. And then you also notice how there's these three great big tubes coming off here on the top, but there's also another one. Let me turn this all the way around. Whoosh. There's another one right there. All of these are the great big arteries that push blood out of your heart and then they get smaller and smaller and smaller as they go all throughout your body. But you can actually feel these two and those two every time your heart beats because those are the arteries that go up your arms. You know how a doctor, if they're gonna feel for a pulse, wait, let me bring this back to me for a second. If a doctor is gonna feel for a pulse on your body to like check your heartbeat, um, what they'll do is they will feel here, right? They'll put their fingers right here and they'll say, okay, now hold still while I'm, while I'm feeling for your blood, for your, for your pulse. And that's because there's a bone right here and one of your arteries is kind of smooshed up against that bone. It's called your subclavian artery. So some doctors are pretty good at feeling for a pulse right there. I, however, am pretty bad at doing that. I, I'm always like, wait, am I alive? What's going on? But the other place that's easy to feel your pulse is in your neck. Find the bend of your jawbone right here, the bend part, and kind of nestle your fingers right there and then start sliding them forward toward the front of your neck. You're gonna hit a point where you're like, oh, wait a minute, I feel something. So I push, push, push <laughs> against my finger. If you don't find it right away, try it again. You can find that bend of your bone Two fingers just underneath it, start sliding them toward the front of your neck. Ooh, and you're gonna get to a point where you're like, oh, oh, I feel. Now what you're feeling is you're feeling those big arteries going stretch, small, stretch, small. Because even though our heart does the beating, those arteries, they stretch bigger. They're like, they're snappy, like a rubber band. So when the blood goes through them, whoa, it pushes them bigger and then poof, they snap back smaller again. And that snapping back is actually helping to push the blood through your heart. What you're feeling right there, I'm going to put that heart back up there for a second so you guys can all appreciate what you're feeling. There you go. If you're feeling that heart beat in your neck right now, you are feeling these two guys right here. Those are called the carotid arteries, and they're the ones that go up your neck. Neat. Man, and there's the heart. Now, how brave are you all feeling to wrap this up? Because I know I've got, we've squeaked a little bit over time. 
You guys want me to open it up? Because you could I you can see the inside of that too. Yeah. All right, Keegan said yes. Okay, if y'all don't like it, don't you can all blame Keegan. <laughs> Here we go. Da -na 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 -na. Heart open. What? That's the front of it. That's the back of it. And if I get my camera down a little more. What you're seeing here is what are called the ventricles, the two big holes that push blood out to your lungs and to the rest of your body. And these two smaller holes up on top, those are called the atria. And they're the ones that have the blood coming back from your body or back from your lungs. And then the blood travels through this funny little thing that looks like a stringy little piece of seaweed in there. That's one of the valves that opens and closes, opens and closes to make sure the blood goes the right direction, doesn't go back. And I do have a little tiny smidge of video that shows those valves opening and closing, but it might take me a little bit of uh, shenanigans to show them. So hold on, give me one second here, guys. I appreciate your patience. Let's see if I can show you. Man, um, Nellie, maybe you could tell me. Is that little video showing that's kind of tan right now? Is that showing that valve opening and closing that video right now? Maybe try again. Oh, I'm hearing some cool music. I don't know where that's coming from, but I like it. <laughs> you know, wait, what I'm gonna do? Hold on, I know what I'm gonna do. Wait, wait, wait. I gotta close this out. Then you guys can see it. Close the, there we go. And to close the, the quick time picture out. And in fact, I'm gonna get that off the screen. I'm gonna get that off the screen for a second because I think what I did was I made Zoom angry. Zoom was like, what are you doing? Stop it. Now I got that other thing out of the way because I want you guys to see that valve opening and closing in there. Ah, there we go. That is the valve opening and closing. And in this particular case, the doctors who are doing that, they are um, they're using water. That's a heart that is being, it's actually having surgery done on it right now. And they're just pumping water through it to make sure that it's working properly. The other video that's kind of a, a darker brown color, that one is a heart valve that has some gunk built up on it called cholesterol. And the valve can't open all the way. So it looks a little more squishy, a little more floppy. First one, it opens all the way wah, to let the blood go pow, through there. And that's, remember I mentioned at the very beginning, my friends, that I was gonna mention exercise and why exercise makes parts of our bodies healthier. One reason why people are always telling us, go outside, run around, go get some exercise, do something, is because the stuff called cholesterol can clog up those arteries and the valves inside of our heart. And if they're clogged up, that means it's not pushing blood properly. But getting enough exercise and eating healthy foods it helps to keep that cholesterol down so your heart stays healthy and those valves work the right way. So there we go, my friends. We have gone through a bunch of crazy specimens that I brought from the museum. I appreciate y'all hanging with me. Even if you were eating, you survived. I didn't gross anybody out too much. I really appreciate you giving me a little bit of extra time too because I wanted to show you all the specimens that I had here. And I'm gonna turn the whole adventure, thanks Gabriel. I'm gonna turn the whole adventure back over to Mally and Katie to wrap things up. Everybody stay healthy out there. We will, we will. We are not, we're all doing what we should. And thanks, Lee, that's always like phenomenal. Um, and just think that you have those on your kitchen table is just like. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so Lee, I will see you tomorrow. And thanks students so. will see you guys tomorrow. We have coming up fossils. Fossils, and I think I found a really cool fossil in my dad's rock box. We have Josh doing his, his finally, his blue whale picture. We have um, volcanoes of Guatemala and drumming and storytelling. I think it was Gabby or Gabriella who wanted that, uh, the, the singing and dancing and drumming with Wakaman. So that's really awesome. Are you gonna come, Lee? show yep 
That was so fun watching him. He's so good. That's awesome. You guys I'm like him. honestly so happy that you came to me. He was very humble that you came and took the time to watch him. So I might have to come watch another one. That's awesome. Yeah. If you know how to find our website, right? Mm, I do. Good. Well, we're there. We're always here. We don't, we're not leaving. So thanks everyone. And thanks Lee. And thanks Gabri Gabriella and everyone who sent pictures and notes today that really made our day. You don't know how much we needed that today. That was awesome. Thanks guys. Bye Charlotte and Isaiah.